Good evening and welcome to the Kern Council of Government's Transportation Planning and Policy Committee meeting. Uh, we have the workshop tonight and the update on the California High Speed Rail Project in Kern County, co-presented by Diana Gomez, Central California Regional Director, and Michelle Bohm, California, uh, Southern California Regional Director with California High Speed Rail. Good evening, and you want, who, you want to begin? Here. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Good evening, and thank you for uh, inviting us. So what I'd like to do is, so I, I'm Diana Gomez, the Regional Director for the Central Valley, and I'm going to cover an update on, on the Central Valley, and then Michelle is going to cover um, an update on what's happening on the Bakersfield to Palmdale section. And uh, then what we we'll can do is entertain questions, and then we'd like to share a video with you that shows the active construction sites up in the uh, Madera County and Fresno County. So on <clears throat> last week we were here, I believe it was last week, it seemed like a long week, <laughs> we had a board meeting here in the city of uh, Bakersfield where um, our board entertained two items that were pertinent to uh, Kern County and the city of Bakersfield. The first one was the uh, approval of the preliminary preferred uh, locally generated alignment, which I'll talk about in a bit. And then uh, also we approved the uh, mitigation uh, dollars for the city of Wasco to assist in the moving of uh, their housing authority uh, complex uh, in, in Wasco as we start. So currently we do have two sections uh, under, are still under environmental review. Up in the north we have near the city of Chowchilla. That's where the trains will go t uh, from uh, the city of Fresno and Madera and head towards the west. So we have a five by five mile section there that we call the Y, which is still under environmental um, review. And then here in uh, between the city of Shafter and Bakersfield, uh, right at Poplar Avenue, we're continuing to study a locally generated alignment that came out of our settlement with the city of Bakersfield. The rest of the section, which is around 119 miles, it's, uh, is under construction and it's uh, in Madera County. Just um, it's around Avenue 17. We just added three additional miles to the construction package, and it goes to uh, Poplar Avenue, which is just uh, north of, of Shafter, and that's approximately three billion dollars worth of, of uh, contracts. Our first construction package, which is construction package one, is uh, 32 miles, and that contractor has been on board the longest. Uh, that's Tudor Perini, and so when you look at the video, that's where you'll see most of the construction uh, activity, uh, specifically on a 1,600-foot uh, viaduct uh, up in Madera County and uh, quite a bit of work in downtown Fresno where we are rebuilding. There's two uh, one-way couplets that go into downtown Fresno, so we are rebuilding one of those and converting that to a two-way two -way direction. The other is construction package 2-3, which is the longest uh, construction package we have, 65 miles. That is uh, the design builders, Dragados Flatiron, and they've been around, July will be one year. So they've been actively uh, designing, and uh, you can start seeing now they started to clear and grub. Uh, we own a significant amount of right-of-way, uh, roughly about six miles of continuous right-of-way. And so they started to uh, clear and grub actually just this week and uh, make room for, for some of the overpasses that will be built in uh, Fresno County. That goes through um, Fresno County, Kings County, Tulare County, and it ends just one mile shy of the Kern County line. Construction package four picks up there and uh, comes 22 miles. All that is in uh, Kern County, except for that one mile portion in Tulare County and it goes uh, through, um, uh, through the city of Wasco and it ends just roughly at uh, Poplar Avenue. And that design builder has been on board for since February. Uh, actually, they just received their notice to proceed uh, less than a month ago. And they have started to move into the city of Wasco where they'll be creating their yard and the designers and um, the uh, construction uh, teams. So they have partnered, California Rail Builders is uh, Ferrovial, and they have partnered with Griffith Construction, which is a company out of uh, Bakersfield. So Griffith Construction will be the primary uh, company that will be doing all the construction. 
So now a little bit about why we were here in Bakersfield uh, last week, which was um, for to have the board approve the preliminary preferred alignment into Bakersfield, which is the locally generated alignment. We do have maps over here um, that you can take. So it's 23 mile a corridor, goes uh, starts right around um, Burbank Avenue and makes its way towards the, uh, the UP. Uh, and so then it will go parallel to Stay Route 99, and then it takes a curve right around Stay Route 204 and heads into uh, downtown, downtown Bakersfield. The proposed station is at F Street and Golden State Avenue uh, at 204, and as I mentioned, it starts paralleling the BNSF and then uh, lines itself up with, with the UP. So we've been working with both the city of Shafter and the city of Bakersfield to refine uh, the proposed locally generated alignment. Our board did approve the, um, uh, the, the, the LGA as the preferred. And so now uh, we will uh, move forward and start holding additional public meetings, continuing to meet with the two of the cities, continuing to refine the alignment as we prepare for the uh, draft that would be circulated sometime in August. So this whole notion of selecting a preliminary preferred to go into the draft is a new process that we've adopted uh, uh, from MAP21. This was at the request of FRA, our federal partner. And so we think that this will give the public a more opportunity for them to weigh in on the preliminary preferred the locally generated alignment is shorter in miles and in travel time. Uh, there's fewer impacts to homes, businesses, and schools. It is uh, more cost efficient. And F Street uh, would still revitalize uh, the location around the area, which is uh, in, in the downtown, downtown uh, Bakersfield. So those are the potential benefits that I, that I talked about. Uh, again, we're gonna continue to meet uh, with, um, with uh, the stakeholders and uh, get, um, get their input, and we hope to have the draft out by August. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle to give you uh, an update on the, the southern portion as we leave uh, the city of Bakersfield. Good evening, thank you for inviting us today. Um, I know some of you, but I don't know all of you. I am Michelle Baim, I'm the Southern California Regional Director for the High Speed Rail Authority. And so what we're working on in our office, which is located in the Metropolitan Water District building in downtown Los Angeles, is everything uh, from Oswald Street south. Um, and you can see up here on the map, uh, the Southern California sections, uh, there is about 330 miles of the alignment. Um, we have it color coded up here so you can see the Bakersfield to Palmdale section in turquoise, the Palmdale to Burbank section in orange, the Los Angeles to, or the Burbank to Los Angeles section in green, and then the Los Angeles to Anaheim section in blue. That makes up the phase one portion, the southern end of the phase one portion of our project. And then you can see in yellow our Los Angeles to San Diego section, which is part of our phase two section. Uh, we are very, very actively working um, through the planning process on our phase one section right now and working towards environmental clearance. Uh, so, you know, the important part, obviously, of what we're doing is we're bringing high speed rail to the most populous. Uh, area of the state. We're closing an existing rail gap across the Tehachapi Mountain. And so uh, we've got a lot of stuff going on. Um, while we are doing our work, we're looking for opportunities to make concurrent investments um, where we can begin to bring building blocks, pieces of the high speed rail project um, into construction uh, that can be used by other rail providers before high-speed rail is completely uh, is, is completed is something that we're looking at and then we're looking to make sure that we are ready to go we want all of phase one to be shovel ready and so our environmental uh, clearance dates are the end of 2017 we're working to get that clearance um, on all of that section Bakersfield all the way down to Anaheim by the end of 2017 um, 
those of you who I've met with before, we've talked about that date. That date has not changed. So of course here, our Bakersfield to Palmdale section is about 75 miles and of course um, it goes uh, through really, really different areas of the state of California, starting in the Edison area, going up the north slope of the Tehachapis, across the top, across the city of Tehachapi, down the south slope, um, and then into the city of Lancaster. Um, there are stations, of course, at both sides in Palmdale and in Bakersfield. Um, and it's a really, really diverse area that this travels through. Um, we have some downtown areas and some school areas. We've certainly got environmental justice communities, ranches and natural lands, um, very different as we cross the Tehachapis than some of the other areas that we're looking at in Southern California. Um, and then, of course, the agricultural businesses and the mining businesses and, and the need to protect them and make sure that those businesses continue to thrive as we plan our project. Here is uh, sort of a brief history of the work that we've been doing on this project since 2010 to identify uh, the conceptual alignments that we would study through the environmental pro process. And you can see on the side, although it's a little bit small, but if you look along the side, 2010, 2012, 2016, you can see that the alignment has changed and evolved over time. It's actually been moving further west as we've been studying, and that means that it's been getting shorter. So the time between Bakersfield and Palmdale has been getting shorter as well. And it's really an ongoing process, and there's some information up there. You know, we take a look at these, we go out in the field, we collect data, we talk to stakeholders, and over time we learn things that help us improve the alignment. Um, we also improve the operational characteristics, and that's really important. Um, over the course of the last several years, we've taken a good long look at this crossing. We've reduced the grades of this crossing, and so we are very, very uh, proud, basically, of what you see up here, although we are very aware that this is not the final condition. We've made a lot of progress. We've made a lot of improvements, but there's still a lot of conversations to to be had. Um, in uh, the Edison community area, a lot of the conversations uh, revolved around the agricultural businesses and packing houses in the Edison school district there. We've been able to avoid those impacts at that location, pulling our alignment over closer to the SR58 in order to maximize the existing transportation corridor there. As we go up across the Tehachapis, I, I talked a little bit about the fact that we've been able to optimize that crossing so we can have those trains traveling very, very quickly um, across the mountains. We've been working with the Tejon Ranch. We've been working with some of the other ranch owners up there to make sure that we can avoid impacts to how they're using their properties today. We've been in discussions with the city of Tehachapi, and we've had some big changes to our alignment there based on those discussions with the city to make sure that what we're planning uh, works with what their future plans for development are in the city. And then as we come down the backside of the Tehachapis, we've been in discussions um, with uh, the county of Kern as well as others to make sure that we could avoid impacts to the green energy generation because that's a very important component of the economy. Um, so we've made improvements in all of those areas. Uh, one of the ways that we learn about this project and are able to make these improvements is through our outreach process. Here's some information. Um, just uh, last fall in 2015, we had community open houses um, across this alignment to reach out and get feedback uh, from community members and make sure that we're informing them about what they're doing so that they are aware and know what the high-speed rail project is doing. Um, we have had, as you can see up there, over 155 different meetings with either individuals or small groups to get more information and understand the character of the communities that we're uh, traveling through so that we can do the best job with our alignments. Here's our timeline. As I mentioned, uh, our plan is to complete the final environmental document here for Bakersfield to Palmdale in the winter of 2017. Um, 
And as Diana mentioned, the High Speed Rail Authority is looking at a new process um, to go through the release of the draft and the selection of a preferred alternative. And so we will be looking at selecting a preferred alternative, although as you could see from the map, there's not a lot of variation in this particular section. There's a couple of places where there's some. Um, we want to make that selection um, ahead of the draft environmental document to give the public um, and stakeholders the maximum amount of time to digest what we're talking about and then us the maximum amount of time to sit down with them and to work out um, any of the issues so that when we get to a final document, um, we all agree that we've done the best job possible. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. N any questions on this presentation? Does anyone have anything, any questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Uh, somebody? So we, yeah, so we have a, a video that oh, we'd right. like to show. Thank you. Good morning, we're here at the uh, downtown Fresno Viaduct and just showing some status of what we have going on here, what the contractor has already constructed. So down below approximately 80 feet is the pile. There is concrete there. So now the next pour will come up and that'll be the column. The contractor right now is getting ready to start setting up the forms for the columns and for the flares. The structure that goes over 99 is a signature structure, so you're going to see a fancier type of bridge there. It's going to be an arch shape. The viaduct is going to be coming straight this way, over 99, and then behind us in a straight line out, out north to the building that you see in the background with the two S's. Continued now with, uh, with the remaining four columns closer to the U Union Pacific uh, right away. We'll finish that up and once the girders come up, then we'll be able to start doing the, the structure, the superstructure. So it's going to be a bridge that will have traffic two ways. Stanislaus eventually gets demolished. Once the bridge is built, then they can open up the traffic as well. But it, it's also going to depend on when, when we demolish Stanislaus. We are here at the uh, Fresno Trench. We are in between the Ys, and what that is, it's a uh, side tracks that the uh, Union Pacific uh, Railroad owns, and we are building the trench in between the Y. We've already done the lagging piles. The next operation is to do the secant piles. You will see a trench here that'll be about 40 feet deep that eventually will go down below State Route 180, which you see up ahead of me. And then everything in between will get excavated out. This will be material that we use for our, our bridges and other locations. This is Dry Creek, which is not dry right now, but uh, there is a canal going through there. And we got to go under that canal. And we also got to go under the Union Pacific track that you see ahead there, the, the Y. And then go under State Route 180. We are here at another location um, that is under construction for the high-speed rail, and with me here is Mike Weber, the construction senior. Uh, let me just give you a brief update on the project today. The new on-ramp for southbound 99 here at McKinley has um, been widened and upgraded. So the bridge widening has been completed. We still have some barrier to go up on top of the bridge deck. These walls, they're finishing up, and then they'll, they'll start on the adjacent dirt work down below, finishing up the barrier. So we were here in February. We had just poured the footing of this wall. So this wall now has been completed with the exception of the, there's a barrier rail goes up on top. So Ashland Avenue, we're currently in stage one of reconstructing the southbound off-ramp. We still have a retaining wall to construct on the west side of that stage one work. Once that's complete, we'll begin the stage two, which is ultimately the left side or the left going southward.
We're here at the San Joaquin River Viaduct location. Immediately to my right, to the east here, is the Union Pacific uh, Railroad track. You are looking right now at the alignment and where that orange fence is up ahead. That's actually where we're going over Union Pacific. Is this where the pergola is going to go? This is the pergola. So a pergola is a structure that is offset from alignment because down below you still got to get the train Union Pacific has to run with a certain opening and we're running up on top of them. So we have to build a structure that allows us to run on skew. This is the entrance as people come in on the north side as people coming into Fresno. So that also has the uh, arch structure. The contractor currently is uh, working on tying the rebar cages together. Th those are the rebar cages for the piles. Let's, uh, let's go straight to the top then. So now they put uh, the, the formwork and the steel for what will be the slab of our uh, structure, superstructure, where the train will actually be running. And as we look south, just to the south of where that crane is, is the, the abutment and it's the final end of the, this viaduct here. We still have a piece in the middle here that we have to build, and that's the piece that goes over State Route 145. Once we get all of this done, we'll continue north. The forms, they are manufactured specially for these projects, and it's a variable parabolic design. If you see the one that's cast here right in front of us, uh, you know, it just kind of flares out, and then the front is actually flat. Yeah. So the variable par parabolic is what you'll see throughout the state, not only on CP1, but throughout the state. Everything else is uh, pretty much set, and like you see here, we're just building the superstructure. Well, thank you very much for inviting us. I'm not sure if you have any questions, um, but uh, we do appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, give you an update on the on the segments through Kern County. Anyone have any questions? Thank you. Yeah, appreciate you coming and, and uh, love the video, people talking, people working. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, appreciate you working with the city of Bakersfield. Uh, you know, we had the lawsuit and, and you took a serious look at our idea and, and it worked out to be good and I appreciate that. We do, we do appreciate the, the two cities working with us. And uh, if you look at the alignment today, it's not what it was first, uh, when it was first uh, presented to us. And so we've been uh, doing significant refinements to avoid uh, some of the property owners and mitigate for, for uh, some of the, the items that they had brought up, some of their issues. Great, appreciate it. Thank you. Any, you know, we're all anxious about the uh, heavy maintenance facility. When's that decision made? Well, we're, we're continuing to evaluate um, as we develop the contracts. Um, so we are, the, the one contract that should be coming out next is the rolling stock um, contract that will uh, we'll select a contractor that would be building the, uh, the train sets. And so we're looking to see how we can couple that decision of the heavy maintenance facility, because we would like to see the, the train sets assembled here in the Central Valley and uh, have that contractor build a heavy maintenance facility. So we're trying to uh, work through those kinds of details to see how we can make that happen. So we're, we're hoping that that decision comes soon. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Ms. Um, Gomez and Ms. Bame uh, for your presentations tonight. Thank you very, very much. At this time, we'll uh, take a break until 6.30. Let everyone get seated.
Okay, I'm going to call to order the Kern Council of Governments Transportation Planning and Policy Committee meeting. Before we say anything, some news came to us prior during the presentation. Kern Council of Governments employee Tammy Jones's daughter, Jordan, is in the ICU at a hospital locally. So please keep her and her family in your prayers. Thank you very much. So at this time, we'll stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and Second District Supervisor Zach Scrivener is going to lead us tonight. Thank you. Roll call, please. Here. Smith. I'm here. Wood. Here. Pasquale. Here. Wilkie. Cantu. Lauer. Here. Prouts. Yes. Pryor. Here. Bill Smith. Wigman. Here. Pouch. Here. Scribner. Here. Miller. Here. Hara. Here. And Tiernan. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, this is this portion of the meeting for public comments. It's reserved for persons to address the committee on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the committee. Committee members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the committee at a later date. Speakers are limited to two minutes with the authority of the chair to extend the time limit as deemed appropriate for conducting the meeting. Please state your name and address for the record prior to making a presentation. Anyone from the public? Yes, sir. Sal Moretti, City of Bakersfield Solid Waste Division. I'm glad two minutes is all I get. I'm on the way to Leonard Skinner tonight. So, <laughs> so I'll make it brief. But uh, I want to come out here every so often and say thanks. You guys are a big part of our freeway litter program. You, you contribute about $150,000 to the program, which takes care of a crew for a year. And uh, that, along with Caltrans funding and some private sponsor funding and even some city money that's been put into that, has allowed us to uh, put together, I was just talking to uh, Barbara Paulson at the Homeless Center, eight crews now are out working. Most recently, two new crews have started. Um, um, Cynthia Lake put together a program for downtown Bakersfield, and uh, she's got a couple people out there funding a couple people out there four days a week. And then um, Holly Lazzarini put together a, an incredible donation and is allowing us to do bike trail. But you guys are worried about highways, but it all started with here with you guys and with Kern Cog and Caltrans coming together with the city and, and helping us put together this program. So um, again, I want to thank you all for, con and I hope continuing to uh, fund the program. It's doing great. It's putting people to work. It's putting people into housing. One of the exciting things I've learned is just how much we're stretching out our HUD dollars and, and all of our crew members, as they work long enough, they're able to qualify for housing and they are in housing now. So, and their families are in housing. So we're changing the cycle of, of homelessness for those people and, and we're growing the program. So that means more people are getting a chance to get it to break out of that cycle. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Sal, for all you've done too, to, to put this program together. And uh, in, we've seen a lot of benefits. Yes, sir? Yeah, I just wanna say it's a great program, works good all the way around, like you say, for the homeless, and, and the litter looks much better. The freeways look a lot better all the way around, and I'll see you at Leonard Skinner. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Thank you, Seth. Any other public comments? Seeing none, we'll move to the consent agenda, opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial by a Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no member of the committee or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent, count, uh, consent agenda excuse me, and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the committee concerning the item before the uh, action is taken. Uh, we have several items on the consent calendar. Anyone in the public have any questions, comments, or anyone up here have any of the items that they'd like to speak to? Okay, seeing one, I'm looking for a motion to approve the consent calendar. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, yeah, yes. sorry. She's right. Laura. Yes. Smith. Yes. Wood. Yes. Pasquale. Yes. 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 Couch. Yes. Hi. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. Um, I'm not going to Leonard Skinner, so I'm not trying to hurry this along. I'm just a quick reader. 
Okay, so item number five, uh, timeline for the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan Amendment Number 1, 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program and Corresponding Air Quality Conformity Analysis. Ms. Pacheco. Good evening, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Kern-Cog staff is providing the update schedule for, as you mentioned, the 2014 Regional Transportation Plan, Amendment Number 1, the 2017 Federal Transportation Improvement Program, and the corresponding air quality conformity analysis. This schedule will be used to move the documents through the review process with final approval by federal agencies in December of this year. The action requested is that the Transportation Planning Policy Committee approve the development timeline. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Comments? It looks like we're going to approve the timeline, so I'm looking for a motion to approve the timeline. So moved. Second. Okay, voice vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstained? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we're moving on to item six. Uh, that's federal air quality conformity update. And that's Mr. Ball. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair Committee members. This is an information item. Uh, it's uh, in follow-up to a presentation that was made to Congress by the uh, San Joaquin Valley Air, Con Air Pollution Control District's uh, director, Syed Sahedrin, uh, on April 14, uh, 2016. He uh, testified there uh, that uh, to the Energy and Commerce Subcommittee uh, on HR 4775, Ozone Standards Implementation Act of 2015, proposing uh, needed changes to the Federal Clean Air Act, uh, which hasn't been amended in over 25 years. Uh, here's an excerpt from his testimony, and I'm just going to read a, a couple of lines out of this. But uh, the um, uh, reality, he says, uh, that we face today uh, sets up regions such as the San Joaquin Valley for failure, leading to costly sanctions and severe economic hardship. And these costly sanctions actually land right here with the regional transportation planning process and federal air quality conformity. If a region is not uh, achieving the standards, the national standards for air quality, uh, the action is uh, called a conformity lapse. And that conformity lapse means that we can no longer advance projects that are expanding our transportation capacity within the region. Uh, until we can uh, demonstrate that we're going to continue to achieve the air quality um, uh, goals. And so uh, he says, we face these dire uh, consequences uh, despite having already done, and he has a long list of following things, including uh, the toughest air regulations on uh, stationary sources uh, in the nation. We've spent over $40 billion uh, by businesses on cleaning the air and over $1 billion of public-private investment on incentive-based measures reducing over 100,000 tons of emissions. Uh, these reduced emissions, we've reduced emissions by 80%, but need another 90% reduction in emissions to meet the new standards. The background ozone concentrations in the San Joaquin Valley is estimated to be greater than 50 parts per billion, with some estimates as high as 60 parts per billion. The new ozone standard set at 70 parts per billion li leaves little or no room for man-made local emissions. Additionally, the latest federal PM 2.5 standards of 35 uh, micro micrograms per cubic millimeter uh, in the on the 24-hour standard and the 12 uh, micrograms per cubic millimeter on the annual standard also approach natural background levels. And uh, there's a couple of charts in here uh, that show uh, <coughs> the uh, distance that we currently have between where we're at now, even though we've made tremendous reductions in our air quality, and where we have to get to. And uh, the um, uh, the issue is one that we'll be watching very closely in our regional air quality conformity process over the next couple of years as the San Joaquin Valley Air District rolls out their state implementation plans. They'll be setting budgets for the on-road source of emissions that uh, your board is responsible for through the uh, federal air quality conformity process and we'll be keeping you up on that. If you uh, uh, like, I also have some additional slides that uh, I can go through. Uh, fairly rapidly if you'd like some more information on this item. Again, it's an information only at this time. That's correct. Anyone like to see the rest of the slide? I like it. 
Okay, let's go. You like information? <laughs> okay, uh, so uh, I'm going to go through these pretty quick, and you have them in your packets, and so if you have some questions, uh, feel free to follow up with us uh, afterwards. Uh, the, uh, uh, well, the main question is, uh, what is air quality conformity, and how is it tied to transportation funding? And as I mentioned previously, it is uh, our transportation dollars that uh, are uh, that lapse that are not allowed to move forward when there is a violation of the Clean Air Act uh, uh, standards. Uh, those standards are set in what's called a state implementation plan and that uh, plan has a budget for different sectors and ours is the transportation sector. Uh, our we actually have two air districts or air basins that uh, prepare uh, state implementation plans uh, uh, within Kern and those two air districts have a total of about seven different planning areas for Kern for different so we're, we're under about seven to n actually I think it's about nine state implementation plans right now with two more on the way including one in East Kern where they're now updating their implementation plan going from uh, marginal to moderate attainment which will give them two additional years uh, to attain the standard over in, uh, in the Mojave Desert Basin area. Uh, but our air is getting better. Uh, last year was the first year that we had zero days in uh, uh, ozone on the oldest of the ozone standards, but we still uh, have a long way to go to get to the current standard of 75 parts per billion, let alone the newer 70, uh, 70 parts per billion that's uh, being considered by EPA. Uh, we also had the uh, least number of particulate matter 2.5 days last year uh, uh, going down to zero. This is the chart showing the uh, distance that we have to go by 2025, uh, 2030 to be able to achieve those new standards. And to do that, uh, basically we would have to eliminate all sources of emissions except for maybe uh, uh, 5 or 10 percent of the heavy duty trucks. So it, it's a really difficult standard that we're looking at. And as mentioned uh, previously, the conformity lapse is, uh, 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 is what halts our transportation funding or at least allowing us our, to advance our projects to move forward. Uh, to show that we demonstrate that, we do a considerable amount of transportation modeling and demographic studies. That transportation modeling uh, information goes into the state's emissions factor model, which uh, generates the emissions based upon the amount of travel that we're predicting in the future. And in that modeling, in our last uh, federal conformity analysis, we were just a half a percent below the 2040 budget for ozone, and that was our biggest area there. Uh, uh, in East Kern, uh, we were 83 percent below the budget. However, East Kern in 2014 exceeded in their uh, monitoring station uh, uh, by 55 days, the uh, th what the monitoring was uh, for uh, exceeding that standard, which caused them to have to go from the marginal to moderate non-attainment and have the extra two years. Uh, last year, I think it went back down to 15 days of exceedance of that. So, so they're, they're making good progress there. Um, uh, there's a variety of things that we can do to reduce emissions. If uh, to get one ton of reduction, if we had 14,000 passenger vehicles that were converted to zero emission vehicles, that would uh, eliminate one ton. If we could uh, uh, transform our fleet to almost uh, be entirely zero emission electric vehicles, uh, that would be a big step. Uh, you also may have heard some climate change issues that we have. and. Uh, there are two separate regulatory worlds in uh, air quality. We have one that's dealing with the uh, uh, Clean Air Act, uh, the Federal Clean Air Act and the amendments from 1990 that deals with this federal conformity issue that uh, uh, could affect our transportation funding, as well as the uh, federal and state environmental regulations where the, seek or where the climate change issues uh, appear. And so we're dealing and juggling both of those issues in our processes. Uh, Kern is in the process of uh, having an opportunity to update our regional climate um, 
targets, our climate change, uh, greenhouse gas emission targets for the region. And right now we're hoping to submit <coughs> new targets by July 29th and doing some modeling to uh, uh, demonstrate those new targets. The um, uh, significant amount of progress has been made overall in this. We really need this H.R. 4775 to go through uh, at the congressional level to give us uh, the breathing room that we need. We've made tremendous uh, uh, strides and uh, there's some uh, uh, excellent remedies in there. Uh, it's difficult. Uh, Congress has not been able to amend the, uh, that, uh, uh, the Clean Air Act primarily because most regions in the nation are not nearly as bad off as we are and so there's not a lot of support for uh, amending the uh, uh, the Clean Air Act. But we've made uh, tremendous work and, and I think these are some very positive changes that are being proposed by the uh, Air District. Uh, so uh, there's a variety of things that we can do. Probably one of the most uh, innovative or uh, promising areas is something called workplace charging. If a uh, uh, business goes in and they're putting in solar panels over their parking lot, if they would just drop the, um, uh, 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 some charging locations for, uh, uh, within that parking lot, the possibility of an uh, individual deciding to purchase an electric vehicle increases dramatically. And uh, that ability to get those 14,000 vehicles uh, either off the road or driving on uh, clean electric uh, becomes much greater. So, so there's a, a lot of variety of other uh, options in there uh, to be looking at. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. I do have a very quick question related to East Kern. What caused that anomaly to occur? Was it um, construction that was going on in East Kern or? Uh, wind events. Yeah. I had a conversation with the uh, staff at there at the uh, Air District and uh, they weren't sure uh, what was causing it uh, uh, but they were uh, exploring some of the situations. I know over here on this side of the uh, air uh, on the valley we've had some problems in the past around um, specific monitoring stations where there was some activity like construction or something like that that uh, created uh, some problems uh, in the interim. Thank you very much, Mr. Ball. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Thank you. I appreciate that. A um, couple things is I think we need to tell the story more and more how we are 80% better and the air is cleaner because that's, you know, you just hear all the time that that's the number one problem with Bakersfield is the air and, and it's much, much better. And the second thing was can we, have we, uh, would it be wise for us to write a letter of support for the HR 4775? Uh, we have not, and if there was, if staff was directed, yeah. I would like that. Consensus? Yeah. Okay. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, anyone else have any questions about this? All right. Moving on. Uh, the next we have is. Caltrans report, Ms. Miller. Good evening. I'm not going to Leonard Skinner either. <laughs> so I'm going to bore you. <laughs> no, I'm not. I, my reports are never boring. I have good stuff. So um, let's start with Lost Hills Lane replacement. That's on State Route 5. It's not State Route 5, it's Interstate 5 between Lairdo Overcrossing and, SR, or and Interstate 5 and the 46 separation. Um, and the contractor is laying continuous reinforced concrete pavement uh, with completion um, this month. Concrete cur curing will follow, which usually takes 14 to 21 days. There's also going to be some shoulder backing, some electrical work, and other repairs as needed. This project is anticipated to be completed in January of next year. The Bakersfield Bridge Preventative Maintenance, that is on uh, State Route 204, Golden State Avenue, between 99 and 178. Uh, it's at set various locations along that route. So far, the work that's been completed is scaffolding and containment at Callaway Canal, heating, straightening of girder at Callaway Canal, 
and then start, they started the scaffolding work at the Kern River. Uh, work that's scheduled for the upcoming weeks is they're going to do some bridge painting on the Callaway Canal and scaffolding and containment again at Kern River and uh, also painting at uh, Kern River. The bridge removal work has been delayed until May 23rd due to some unforeseen issues um, with the contractor's workforce. When they resume, it will require nightly closures, which will last until June or maybe into July, and then two weekend closures to complete the paving. Uh, there is some existing scour damage at various piers on the Kern River that will be addressed during construction. Caltrans is currently working on attaining some uh, various permits uh, from the regulatory agencies like Fish and Game and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. The Sunny Lane pedestrian overcrossing, which is almost done. The contractor is continuing, though, to install the bridge fence, but we're at 95%, and they're um, hoping by the end of this month that that'll be uh, completed. And the eastbound Sand Canyon uh, uh, project, which is on 58, um, at the Sand Canyon Road overhead to Cache Creek Bridge. Um, the bridge construction has been completed and the bridge is open to public traffic. However, the contractor is still currently doing some reconstructing on the ramps. Uh, Cherry Avenue truck climbing lanes. Um, that is going to construct uh, truck climbing lanes and widen shoulders on 119 near Taft from Elk Hills Road to Tubin, Tubin um, Road. The contractor has installed the environmental fence, removed stripes and then restriped, placed temporary K rail, and is removing aerial deposit lead soil, and which started this week on the roadway excavation and embankment. Work scheduled for upcoming uh, this upcoming weeks is some more roadway excavation and embankment work. And that project is anticipated to be completed at the end of this year. And then I've got some future projects. Uh, these are um, some shop projects that um, are getting ready to go to advertising and then award. Um, so we've got Shafter Wasco ADA ramp, and that's going to construct ADA curb ramps on State Route 43 in Shafter and Wasco. Uh, it's scheduled for June uh, CTC vote, and they're planning to advertise this summer and award around October, November. You got uh, a state route uh, 46 and 99, the bridge at Formoso. That's to replace that bridge. They're going to advertise this summer and award, like I said, uh, like the other one, towards the end of the year. The Kern County Seismic Restoration. That's at um, 99 Airport Drive overcrossing and at 99 Golden State Avenue separation. Uh, it's scheduled for June CTC vote. Should be awarded by the end of the year. And then I've got one more, and that's the Kern Avenue pedestrian overcrossing, and that uh, is to make that ADA compliance and upgrade um, the uh, overcrossing, and it's on 99 in Kern County at the Kern Avenue pedestrian overcrossing uh, scheduled for CTC vote advertise in July award by the end of the year so um, hopefully we'll have some new projects in construction by after the winter season uh, starting next year thank you very much um, moving and unless there's any questions any questions moving on to executive director report mr. Hakimi good, e good evening madam chairman and board members I have uh, several items for you tonight um, you and your staff should already know this, but the 2016 ATP applications are due to the state and current COG on June 15th. We have less than a month to go. Uh, we've been very successful in the first two rounds. Let's keep up the effort. Uh, locally here, the TDA Article 3 applications are due July 15th. Those are for bicycle and pedestrian type projects. S California Transportation Commission uh, met in Stockton yesterday and today. Mm -hmm. They adopted <coughs> the 2016 STIP. All three of Kern, Cog, Kern Cog's projects in 
Kern County were saved. We were very successful, one of the most successful counties in the state. Uh, almost all the other counties lost projects. All of our projects were saved. All three of them were delayed, though, because of the funding cr crisis. So thank all of you for your efforts, um, and it, it pays to work with them rather than to uh, ignore them. Also at the CTC meeting today, Bakersfield, Tehachapi, and Kern County had positive votes on all on ATP projects. Congratulations to all three of those agencies. Um, Michelle and Diana went over the high-speed rail meeting. Uh, it was a packed house. There was representative, that was last week, there was representatives from Shafter, Wasco, Bakersfield, Kern County, as well as half a dozen other counties and cities throughout the state, all um, very interested in high, uh, an HMF facility, other facilities. Uh, th the message I took away from that meeting is we, we need to all get on the same page if, if we want a uh, facility here in Kern County. And D Diana and their uh, CEO, Jeff Morales, and their chairman listen. Uh, and they've listened to us over the last several years. There's one item in your folders that I'd like to just take uh, one or two minutes to go over with you. It's called the Local Assistance Report. And I want to just take a few minutes to go over with you. Uh, in the past, I've, I've told you and your staffs that it pays to deliver projects early. When we deliver projects early, we are rewarded. Mm -hmm and we can get more federal funds for the region. I, and this, uh, this chart looks a little complicated, but the bottom line is it, in the chart, is Kern, the agencies within Kern County, all of your agencies, we are our fourth place in the, in the state for delivering our federal projects. We've delivered 44% of our projects and 44% may not sound that good, but if you look at uh, the numbers on this chart, there are many counties in the state that are at 0%. That, so that's the good news, and, and you should congratulate your staff for uh, their ability to deliver often and early. But I, I'd like to be not number four, but be number one. Uh, and we have a, a lot of work to do to, to become number one. Uh, we, we can capture money from all these other counties that are shown on this chart that are not delivering on time. And with the help of your staffs uh, and by cooperating with Kern Cog and the CTC and Caltrans, I'm confident that we can move up by next year to be maybe third or second or, or possibly first. So the message is, is twofold. Congratulations on the, on the work we're doing. We're fourth place in the state. That's a remarkable accomplishment. But we, I think we can do, do much better. So thank you, and uh, let's do, do better as the year closes out. Remember, we still have several more months to get our projects done. Generally, projects are due around July or August uh, to get federal funding. Uh, that, that's all I have this evening, Madam Chairman, subject to, to any of your questions. Well, thank you very much. And um, always let us know if there's anything we can do to even be better at this. Um, anybody else have any questions? Okay. At this time, uh, we move to member statements. On their own initiative, council members may make a brief announcement or a re brief report on their own activities. Uh, in addition, council members may ask a question of staff or the public for clarification on any matter. Provide a reference to staff or other uh, resources for factual information or request staff to report back to the council at a later meeting concerning any matter. Furthermore, the council or any member thereof may take action to direct staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. Does anyone up here have any? Yes, ma'am. I just have something really quick. I just wanted to remind everybody that this is bike month and we're only halfway through the month. So if you haven't got on your bike yet this month, uh, there's still plenty of time. Uh, Public transit is a great way to ride your bike and get to work or get to where you need to go. Golden Empire Transit has a great transit center up at BC if you live in that area and have to come down here to work or um, a great downtown transit. And also another great thing to do, which I'm going to try this weekend, is regional transit has a bus that goes up to Tehachapi that you can get your put your bike on 
-hmm. get up there right around and it's three bucks three three oh three four dollars round, round trip and it they got a three rack um so if you and a friend want to get on get on a bus and take your bike up to Tatchby and ride around and spend an afternoon there I think that'd be a great thing to do for a uh, bike month and also the full moon ride for bike Bakersfield is on Saturday we meet at Beach Park at 8 p.m. thank you thank you very much anything else anyone else all right thank you very again again and I'm a call to adjourn a motion to adjourn the Transportation Policy Planning Committee move and all in favor aye opposed thank you we're moving into the current council of governance meeting Would you uh, we're fine on the roll calls all right public comments this portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the council on any matter not on this agenda but under the jurisdiction of the council council members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed they may also they may ask a question for clarification make a referral to staff for factual information or request staff to report back to the council at a later meeting speakers are limited to two minutes <coughs> please state your name and address for the record prior to making any presentations do we have anyone in the office yes uh, office audience sorry yes sir please i'm chairman members of the uh, call i'm dennis fox something's come up and this has been coming up since i was on the 2010 plan which would be 25 years ago and it is um, <coughs> coordination of the streetlights, it came up again yesterday. And uh, we came up with it then as an alternative. And because cost of freeways at that time, you can make an expressway, you get two for one, that one freeway. I was thinking it would be best if the COG was to do it. There's a lot of people don't know what synchronization is and how it's done. And somebody in the local staff thought it had to do with the speed limit, and it doesn't in prison in charge. And it wouldn't be, uh, it would be a, a neat setup that if we, at that time, thought 7 standard would be a great expressway. And um, I still do think so. But as well as the downtown, coordinate the, tr the uh, traffic lights. And there's not just Bakersfield. Um, I don't want to mention other towns, but uh, there's a few of them that the lights could be a little better coordinated. It might be better, maybe you want to contract with somebody to do it. And I think it's a lot cheaper to do that to reduce the ozone level than to try the, because an ozone is a temperature and exhaust, and every time they hit a traffic light, they take off. And you get all, especially trucks, you get all the, and it's a lot better than uh, working to reduce the temperature, which is really going to be a job pouring ice all over the place, but I don't think it's going to work. And it's just, a, it's an option, I think. It's the nearest, like pool, it's the nearest, nearest ball to the nearest hole. It might be the most cost effective, might be worth looking at. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, anyone else have any public comments? Yes, sir. I just like to comment on that. I, the vast majority of Bakersfield streetlights, I believe, are synchronized. Aaron, would you know about how many or, or percentage-wise? Mm, I, 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 I don't know the percentage, but the, I think the lights that Mr. Fox is referring to are uh, th there's still an issue of of coordination between Caltrans and uh, the city of Bakersfield that could be much better Th those lights have been in place for decades and caltrans has never been able to get the synchronization right uh, he is correct that it, it could be better but it requires coordination with caltrans because lights at either end are still under the ownership of caltrans so the city of bakersfield could do the greatest job in in the world on synchronizing those lights but if they don't have full cooperation and interaction from the Caltrans signals, they, they won't work together. So you're specifically talking about 24th Street corridor, but I was I was yes. saying overall the the city of Bakersfield, uh, throughout I Bakersfield, the vast majority the of the vast majority of them are, are synchronized and are controlled by a traffic operations center. Right. Thank you. I would just like to add, it does. The problem with it is that there's no sign put up. It says signal set for 35. 
And that is, a, if you don't have it, people don't, you know, I wouldn't know it, except I see on the towns that put up signals set. On 24th, it should be up on the freeway so you know what to come through, and you don't hit it at 40 and then hit a light, hit the next light, hit the next light. Just a little signage helps. I'll, 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 I'll continue the conversation one more step. I, I remember Fresno used to have that when I grew up. Uh, yeah. But I believe now they are synchronized to the speed limit is, is the way it's said. Am I right? I, I believe they are. Uh, I've seen signs in Pasadena, as a, an example, they say signal progression 35 miles per hour, to telling people if you drive at this speed that you should hit all the lights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any other com public comments? All right. Um, seeing none, we're going to move on to the consent agenda, opportunity for public comment. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine and non-controversial according to Kern Cog staff and will be approved by one motion if no one um, or and if no member of the council or public wishes to comment or ask questions. If comment or discussion is desired by anyone, the item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered in the listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council concerning the item before it's taken. Uh, this will be a roll call uh, item. Anyone from the public or anyone from um, our dais up here have any questions? All right, concerns? All right, seeing none, I request a motion. Uh, motion. Anyone with a second? Do we get a, s oh, you got a, s Bob got a second? Thank you. Roll call, please. Yes. Smith? Yes. Wood? Yes. Pasquale? Yes. Bauer? Yes. Fouts? Yes. Fryer? Wigman? Yes. Couch? Yes. Scrivener? Yes. All righty. Thank you very much. Um, then we'll move on to the Kern Cog item A, final fiscal year 2016-17 Kern Council of Government's financial plan budget adoption. Are you doing that? Too? I'm oh. going to try it. Okay, there you go, sir. <laughs> Good evening, Chairman Wood, members of the board. This is next fiscal year's budget, and it is the third time that you've seen this document in some form. Not a lot has changed since the preliminary. We have program revenues of about $5.5 million. That's a combination of federal, state, and local sources. We have an expenditures of just under $5 million, and, you know, those cover our personnel our professional services agreements, our <laughs> services and supplies, and some capital items such as a phone upgrade and I think some computer hardware that I don't know what it exactly does, but um, everything in this budget covers the overall work program, which was just approved in the consent calendar. So if you have some questions, I will do my best to answer. If not, we can have a public hearing and get down the road to Leonard Skinner. I felt like I had to work that in somewhere. Oh, you have to. Everyone's trying to work it into the topic, and you're doing a fine job. Uh, any questions before we open public hearing? All right, I'll open public hearing. Any comments? Request a motion to close public hearing. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay. That one's done. And we go on to B. Fiscal year 2014-15, Kern Council of Government's Financial Compliance Audits Report. Again. Sir. You know, I don't know how to work in the reference here, so I'm just going to go straight to the audit report. This is the audit report for the 14-15 fiscal year. I should say this is the 99% final audit report for the 14-15 year. It um, covers the seven funds that we maintain. The report, the opinion issued in the report was, I was going to say unqualified, but that's not true anymore. It's changed to unmodified, which still means the same as unqualified. It means we've presented fairly and accurately according to generally accepted accounting principles. Um, with that, we have Mr. Ryan Nielsen here. He's a principal with the firm of Brown Armstrong, and he'd like to say a few things about the report. Sure. Thank Welcome. You, Appreciate that. Again, my name is Ryan Nielsen. I'm a partner with Brown Armstrong. We could go through this page by page, but I think it'd take about as long as Freebird would. <laughs> There's my reference. So. <laughs> Again, it's my pleasure to present to you the financial statements for the fiscal year ended June 30th, 2015. As you know, each year the council prepares a set of financial statements whereby they present to the public uh, 
that the uh, the information contained therein is in fact accurate and complete. It's our responsibility to issue an audit uh, report or opinion on those financial statements um, to verify that in all material respects that the financial statements um, contain accurate information. The note disclosures are clearly presented. Uh, the council complies with all material um, uh, grant compliance requirements and so forth. And uh, again, as Greg mentioned, the report that we intend to issue will be an unmodified opinion, which means that uh, there are no um, s material misstatements in the financial statements, uh, no material noncompliance with grant agreements and so forth, and otherwise uh, known as a clean opinion, which is the highest level of opinion that a an independent auditor can issue on your financial statements. Uh, we're also required to uh, discuss with you any material uh, challenges that we had in the conduct of the audit, I explain to you any um, significant new um, uh, accounting pronouncements that were issued that were implemented and as most of you, I think, know, there, the most significant new accounting pronouncement was that of uh, Government Auditing Standards Board, or Accounting Standard Board uh, Statement Number 68, which is the implementation of these new pension standards uh, that, that caused a, probably the most significant change to governmental accounting um, and reporting and financial reporting in, in a number of years. And, and uh, ultimately, those standards were implemented in the uh, 2015 fiscal year. There were some challenges with the implementation, uh, that being uh, overall the complexity of the implementation of the standard, but as well as uh, obtaining information from CalPERS, which is the, the um, entity that oversees the, the pension plan and their reporting. We rely on a significant amount of actuarial data and a lot of additional disclosures in the financial statements that are intended to clearly explain to the public um, the implementation of those standards and what we relied upon to present that information in the financial res reports. With that, I will entertain any any questions that you may have on the financial statements. Anyone? Well, thank you very much. And um, then we're going to we Mo make a motion, motion to motion accept to and accept file. file. Motion to accept and file. And a second. All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Thank you very much. Appreciate that, sir. Thank you. Have a good evening. All right. We have uh, moving to Kern uh, 7, Kern Motorist and uh, Aid Authority. Uh, item A, final fiscal year 2016-17 Kern Motorist Aid Authority KMAA uh, financial plan budget. Mr. Plummer? Good evening again. This is our motorist aid budget. It is, uh, we are primarily primarily funded with the uh, dollar um, charge on the vehicle registrations and we are anticipating um, pretty much standard operations budget. We do have one big project. We're down to about uh, 500 or so call boxes that we're maintaining and we've got a project coming up that will upgrade the system to the next generation of wireless but you'll hear a little bit more about that from Mrs. Napier, so I don't want to say too much about it. Um, we can have another public hearing if you'd like. Okay, at this time, I'll open for public hearing. Receiving any comments? Call to close the motion to close the public hearing. Move. Move. Okay. Second. All right. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna move on to item B. And you're on. Uh, no, <laughs> actually it's a 2014-15 Kern Council of Governors Financial and Compliance Audit Reports. No, no, I'm sorry. Flipping over, <laughs> I'm sorry. New page, new B, uh, Ms. Napier, and that's gonna be the Kern Motors Aid call box upgrade. Yes, thank you, Madam Chairman and mem members of the board. Uh, KMA, KMAA's call box system comprises of 460 call boxes in rural count Kern County. Um, it operates right now with second generation 2G wireless technology that is currently vulnerable to cyber attacks and is being phased out by service providers. Several of KMAA's, well actually 
specifically one of KMAA's call boxes was uh, comprised, compromised, um, resulting in a $10,000 charge on our Verizon um, wireless cell bill. Luckily, uh, we identified that, that charge and were able to get it reversed, and that call box number was actually turned off. Um, this was not an isolated incident. It happened all over California. So it, I, in the Bay Area, I was talking with one of, the, um, one of my counterparts in the Bay Area, and they had actually a $40,000 charge on one of their call boxes. And what they had done was they had taken, they had taken the number somehow from the call box because it's a 2G system and it's easy to compromise. They take, took that number and were actually making calls overseas. So it was bizarre, to say the, to say the least. Uh, K-Systems Incorporated, the company that maintains uh, KMA, KMAA's call boxes, manufactures a circuit board specifically for call box units that allows for service upgrade from 2G to 3G voice and 4G data. And it will extend the life of the system. The C100 circuit boards are proprietary units designed to integrate with the current call box electronics for a fast and smooth transition to newer generation voice and data technology. Because of this proprietary design, staff has submitted a sole source justification and request for this contract. The last upgrade to the call box system was in 2007 8 when it was converted from analog to digital. The cost of the circuit boards is $750 per board with a $50 installation fee for a total of $368,000, including an upfront payment of $103,500 for manufacturing the circuit boards. The funding for this contract is budgeted in the 1617 budget, which is also which you also approved um, earlier tonight. KMA and K Systems will be coordinating the system upgrade with Verizon Wireless for a seamless transition, which will also result in a savings of approximately $3,500 per month in wireless costs. This contract also will not affect your ability to continue the, the contracts for the litter and debris removal on the state highways. And our request tonight is approve the sole source purchase of 460 C100 devices to upgrade the KMAA call box system at a cost of $368,000 with an advance payment of $103,500 for manufacturing the necessary hardware. And I will be happy to answer any questions if you have any. So this is happening all over California or all over any, any other place that has the older technology? It's happening all over California, and this is the $750 is the same price that every, every other motor state authority is paying that uses case systems. And again, they, these were developed, um, case systems basically developed our boxes, and these were developed to operate with all the technology that, that is currently there. So I didn't catch where are they going to be manufactured, because they're going to actually be building these. Yes, they, they will be manufactured, I believe, at their headquarters down south. Okay, thank you very mm -hmm. much. Any other questions from anyone or the public on this matter? I have a question. Yes, thank sir. Thank you. Um, is there any statistics on how often the call boxes are being used? Um, daily, monthly, yearly use? I, I do have those. I don't have them with me tonight. Our, our call box usage has gone down in the past. Um, from the very early development to current, it, it is a lot lower than it used to be. Um, this board has been pretty, you know, like what's the word? They, ha they have directed us that they wanted to, I'm sorry, what? Brilliant, brilliant. yes, you've been very brilliant. Mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, we, th but this board has requested that we keep them in the rural areas. Uh, we did take um, quite a few calls. We had, I think, originally 500, Greg's probably gone now, 500 and I want to say 60 call boxes. We've taken out about 100 of them in the Metro Bakersfield area uh, because there's so much cell usage or so much cell coverage. But out in some of the rural areas, we still do not have, um, great cell coverage in places it's getting better all the time uh, especially with the 3g and the 4g technology 
but um, this board has requested in the past that we keep it in the rural areas for now. Did you have something? Uh, uh, Madam Chair, if, if I can add, so the, the contract to maintain and operate our call box system expires in almost exactly a year. So we will be having a discussion uh, within the next year about the future of our call box system. The, the, we will put out a contract for bid and, and we will see uh, where, what those prices come in and we will seek guidance from you if, if necessary if we need to further scale back the system to match uh, the revenue that we have. But, but to answer your questions, some of the call boxes uh, may never be used uh, and may have zero calls per year. There's other, other call boxes that have two or three call, uh, calls a year. Uh, the calls are getting obviously more expensive. Uh, as as um, Council Member Smith uh, from Tatchby um, reminds us, you know, sometimes we do save lives with these we, with these call boxes. He he has a specific example uh, near Tatchby, where a call boxes may not be used for years. Yet he ha he had a specific example where someone rolled over in their car, cell phone flew out, and the only thing that saved their lives w was, was the call box. So yes, the call boxes are getting used less and less and less, and this board will have a decision to make in the next year if we, if we want to continue um, the call box program or if we want to continue to reduce the number of call boxes in maybe in other cities that have excellent cell phone coverage. But the direction we've gotten so far is um, don't pull them out of the very rural areas with, with very low traffic because you could get in an accident in the middle of the night and maybe the next car that comes by might be two hours. I, I would like to add that um, I was coming back from vacation um, on Monday and I actually on I-5 in Kern County, which surprised me because I'm pretty sure I had cell service, but maybe the individual did not have a cell phone or his cell phone, his or her cell phone was dead, but one of our call boxes was being used. Mm -hmm. And um, there was something else. I would, oh, I, I would also like to remind you that in order to keep getting the dollar registration fee for Kern Motorist Aid, which also includes our 511 system, um, we have to have a system of call boxes. It's, that's in the law still, currently. And until that maybe is changed, I, um, we do have to have, quote, a system. And in order to take out any more of the call boxes, we would have to uh, get approval from Caltrans and come up with a uh, removal plan. Well, then the question becomes, can you use, if you have, let's say we have a lot more traffic and what have you, 511, can that be part of a system? Well, no, you don't, can't re report back. Could there be an add-on or something to the, to report from 511? Possibly, yes, sir. <laughs> you didn't even give me a chance. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um, thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Yeah, the, the answer to that question technically is yes. The reason that we opted to not uh, install that uh, feature in our 511 service was because uh, other parts of the state, the larger parts of the states that have done so, uh, have not been terribly successful with it. Uh, they, they've not seen a, a whole lot of usage with it. And so at this time, uh, simply because of the, the traffic volumes, we chose not to implement it. Thank you. But the thing is, is that you're, you're saying that we have, in order to get those funds, that you have to maintain the call box system. You have to maintain a call box system. A call box system. So. And you have to get approval to, for the call boxes that you have currently. If you take out more than 10% of your oh. call boxes, which quite honestly we already have in the metro area, um, if you take out more than 10%, you're supposed to have a removal plan approved by Caltrans mm -hmm. prior to removal. So it looks like we have some decisions to make in the coming months. All right, anyone else have any other questions about this? Yes, sir. I wanna make sure I understood. We're, we're gonna upgrade the current call boxes but in about a year, we may be making a decision to take some of 
more of them out. So I, that that may be true. Currently, the the only the call boxes that we have are all still in the rural areas, and um, I thought we took out. A, I thought w my recollection is I thought we were going to take them out, especially if they started to fail. We just wouldn't repair them if they were in an area where there was pretty adequate cell phone coverage. Is that was that part that, of our well? For example, out on um, 46 on the way to Paso mm -hmm. Robles, when they finished that project of the of you know the double laning mm -hmm. and, and all of that we did not put the call boxes back in we just right. made I didn't uh, Aaron made that decision to just not have those call boxes reinstalled um, and in a lot of places that's what what we're doing again we're kind of overstepping the rule of the law but it's with Caltrans's, our local Caltrans's blessing. <laughs> so I, I will leave it at that because they, Caltrans really does not want um, people stopping on the side of the highway to use a call box. They would rather they get off the highway. In fact, that's what they have freeway service patrol for now is to get vehicles off the off the freeway. I understand, but my real issue is it's $368,000 to upgrade the whole system. Right, but and what some of them we're going to we may make a decision We may about a make year a to decision take to take out in a year. It so takes can we, about can we, can we pair that back to which Can we take another look at that? Before, which or do we one, need to move on this? Which okay. one what? Which ones would you not I don't know. That's right. We'd have to take a look at that. That's what I, those, that's what I think yeah. we need to look at. And should we make that decision with Caltrans's approval um, it, we first? Would, we would have we to get a plan. We'd have to put a plan together to to take those to take those out. And again, our do we have the ability to do that? Uh, well, sure, I can put it. I can. Well, put what's a, the? Do we have a risk? It of takes time. People people hacking into this again and us getting yes. What currently what we're doing and the reason we're going to have a savings with Verizon is we've gone to a government account. So we're going to be changing all of the numbers on all of the call boxes. And they're all gonna be 3G and 4, 3G voice and 4G data. So they are, they're much, much harder to hack into. And that's why almost every other motor state authority in California is doing this and has a lot of them have already already upgraded their systems and I, I completely understand your question so it, it that's you know a decision of the board it's just they're gonna they're going to quit working the call boxes that we have out there if we don't do something they're going to quit working and some of them already have. <clears throat> I guess my last comment is I think I would rather us take a look at what our plan is going to be for removal before we go upgrade all of them, especially if in a year we're going to be taking some, making, potentially making a decision to take some of them out. I, I, I hope I didn't mislead the board. It's completely your decision whether you want to remove any more bo boxes. W we presented a plan a couple of years ago to remove them in the metro area. We coordinated with Caltrans, got approval to do that. At the time, there, there was not a desire from the board to go any further. A, a year from now, w when we negotiate a new contract, uh, we will have to see wh where those prices come in. Uh, if, if the price to maintain the smaller amount of call boxes exceeds the money that we have coming in, we may have to enter into negotiations or we may, may have to scale back our system. That, that's c this, this board will likely have to make s some of those decisions in the next year. There is, is no requirement that we scale back the system that we have. Absolutely, we can continue. What's the desire of the board? <coughs> well, it sounds, if I may, the, it sounds like the, the timing is, is against us here. We, we need to move forward on this upgrade, but we may in the future um, scale back on how many call boxes we have 
but we don't know that at this point. And my question is, is this, is this upgrade, um, is this, a, it does the price tag on this on this particular contract that you are proposing is this going to is this going to um, would it make a big difference if we had a greatly reduced number or um, w or would it be something that we could um, amend the contract later if we determine that we're going to have several less call boxes I, don't, I just I don't know if having how many less call boxes is going to affect the the price for this which is what about three hundred and sixty eight thousand dollars do you know do we know I let me make sure I understand the question um, currently we probably have some call boxes down uh, for construction that are included in the 460 if you want to just I mean leave the, they included them because they plan on putting okay. them back up but if you wanted to leave those down then you would just deduct um, eight hundred dollars per box from the three hundred and sixty-eight. That's that's the cost. It's eight hundred dollars per box. Okay, I see that now. So um, yes, we could scale we could scale it back to whatever is currently up and operating, and and just leave down the boxes that aren't. The I don't know if I know how to put this. The way the call box system was put in, it was put in like every every mile, I believe, in the urban area and every two miles in the outlying areas. So if in the outlying areas you take out a box that's, you know, maybe two boxes, then you're, go you're going to be six miles between mm -hmm. boxes. If, and if that, that's that's kind of the dilemma. Is sure, I understand. And I guess at this point, I'm not I'm not in favor of scaling back the call boxes anymore. We went through that, and I think we made a thoughtful decision about which ones we would remove and and uh, which ones we would like to keep. And so I I'd be in favor of moving forward with this. If we get to a point where we may have to eliminate um, some down the line, then you know that I I understand the what. Um, Supervisor Couch is bringing up, but I, I just I don't anticipate that at this time. And we do have a situation that we're currently trying to address, which is the technology that we have um, is not in keeping with the times, especially with the abilities of cyber attacks. So I, I I'm in favor of moving forward with it. I'll make a motion to approve the sole search per sole source purchase. Thank you, sir. Any a second on that? I, I second that. Okay. Uh, can, I, can I speak to yes, sir? one more, one more, one last thing? And that the reason I'm concerned about that is I'm looking at the bottom line figure, and to preserve the ability to continue the cleanup, I think we're going to eventually have to scale back on the boxes. Okay. Is that is that an accurate assumption? It, a lot of it depends on the revenue. Assuming it's, assuming yeah, it's assuming status quo contract, that they don't quo. charge us any more. Um, pretty soon we're going to run out of well, revenue. Th that, that is accurate, Supervisor Couch. We, we are spending more money than we have coming in. So eventually we're, we're going to either have to get a lower price to maintain the boxes or scale back our litter, litter removal. But, but the the assumption that um, that we will get a lower price in the future for maintaining these call boxes is is not necessarily a valid uh, assumption that there is very little competition in fact there's only one contractor that does this work in the state and the call boxes that we have left are very spread out so, so the the costs are not likely to go down very much that prob but doesn't that probably lead to we're not going to have we're going to run out of money for the cleanup even faster? What, well, let, let me add that the the sheriff's department did uh, terminate the contract for enforcement, so so that did free up some money. So now we are just doing litter pickup only. Uh, Sal was here. Uh, yeah. We, we did use this money to, to get them started. They've been very successful in the city of Bakersfield and it is attracting a lot of private investment. So it is likely in the future that I will recommend scaling back some of those contracts. 
the, the other thing that I should mention is that when they take out a box, even an upgraded box, it's still our box. And it is stored here in Bakersfield. So those, those upgraded boxes can replace boxes that go bad if that ever happens. So, it, it, or they, if they're damaged, yeah. So, I mean, we, we have them run into all the time. So that, you know, when they get damaged, they will, they, we can use some of the older, old call boxes to replace them. If I may. Thank you. If I may, Chairman. Yes, sir. Well, I have a com uh, comments and a question. Uh, this agreement, it, it, uh, for what's the term of the agreement? This agreement or Ye the agreement w the for maintenance? Uh, the full maintenance. For maintenance, that, that agreement ends May 31st of 2017. Well, I, I don't, I think it's not too, it's not too um, uh, long of an agreement. And however, as technology improves, you know, I believe probably this is going to be the last time that we can, that we, we might invest in this uh, service, you know, as technology improves. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you know, I, I agree with uh, um, uh, Mr. Couch in regards, you know, to look into the agreement and, and how we can come up with a better solution in regards to, you know, how long we can keep it up and how often it's going to be used. But it, it is very clear that the use is going to, you know, minimize, uh, you know, as the time goes. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm in favor, you know, to continue, you know, with the service and to uh, invest uh, uh, this time. Okay, any other comments? Because right now we have a motion to approve. And I second. you seconded, all right. So, um, any other comments before we go on? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. It carries. Thank you. Um, moving on to executive director's report, Mr. Hakimi. Good evening again, Madam Chairman and board members. As Ms. Para mentioned, tomorrow, May 20th, is Bike to Work Day. Hope to see you on your bicycles. I see uh, Council Member Smith on his bicycle quite often. Uh, remember, we are dark next month, and let me take just a minute to go over what's in your folders tonight. There's a timeline uh, from May out till September. Outreach efforts, the local assistance delivery report that I took a few minutes to go over um, earlier tonight. There's uh, several newspaper articles about how many transportation tax measures are out there. There's a copy of the high-speed rail presentations uh, that were made earlier tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, there's an article on San Diego County's tax measure and the struggles that they are having um, renewing uh, one of the most successful tax measures uh, in the state. It's very, very interesting articles article uh, by columnist Dan Walters about California highways leading to nowhere. Mm -hmm. Also an article, this is of special interest to several of you, uh, the, the CTC commissioner that represented uh, Central California, we considered him our representative on the CTC, was not reappointed to the California Transportation Commission. There is a vacancy on the CTC Commission, if any of you are interested. It, w it is a, um, a governor's appointee vacancy. An article on self-driving semi-trucks and, and a, l a link to uh, a very interesting video that shows actually operational semis uh, without drivers. Bakersfield uh, Thomas Rhodes Improvement Report status report a schedule of cash disbursements for April, and some high-speed rail uh, route maps and station area planning maps. Uh, subject to any of your questions, Madam Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much, Mr. Hakimi. Anyone have any questions? Okay. Uh, then we, we know that we're going to be dark in June. Uh, 
So our next meeting will be July 21st, 2016. At this time, I request a motion to close this meeting. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So carried. And please um, keep uh, Tammy Jones's daughter, Jordan, in your prayers tonight and her family. Thank you so much.